Hey everybody, welcome uh, to the live chat. Um, I am excited about this because this is the first quarterly real estate update that we are doing. Um, those of you that don't know, Fitbox has partnered uh, with Neo Home Loans to offer everybody mortgages. We're rolling about, out a bunch of different calculators and tools on the Fitbox uh, membership profiles and all that type of stuff. So check those out. And again, we're glad that that Neo is coming on to do this. We're going to be doing it uh, once a quarter. Um, I do have another announcement. A lot of you have been asking me to do uh, my courses and stuff in general. Um, I talked to Josh. He's joining us from Neo today about potentially doing like a real estate investment course. And I'm still like 50-50 on it because it's like it, it takes a lot of time to do that stuff. Um, so if you guys do want us to potentially do something like that, you know, let me know and like in the comment section, be like, yeah, I'd be interested in a real estate course. Um, because if we do do that, I may ask a, you know, a handful of you of like five to 10 of you to kind of do like a kickoff course and get tested, get some feedback before we launch it live. So if you're interested in doing that, just let me know. Let's jump into it. Cause I'm excited to get, of course, interest rates rising, all this stuff. You guys got a lot of questions. Uh, Josh is here, um, to do the, the quarterly update, Josh, any uh, initial words of advice we, we want to kick this off with? Well, I was just thinking as you were talking about kicking off that new real estate course, if anybody has like a time machine where we could make more hours in the day, that would be really <laughs> helpful because Joe and I have about a million ideas and then we realize, okay, I can only work like 20 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually, I was just asked by uh, one of our board members if I, if I could wave a magic wand, like, what would I do? I'd be like, make the day about 40 hours long. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so I, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. Um, one of the big questions that I've gotten, and I'll kick this off a lot, because I, you're in this way more than I am in terms of seeing interest rates and all that type of stuff. Um, just in gar regards to rates, like just... What have you guys been seeing? Because I've seen some people being like, well, I got a 6.25% rate or I got a 5.5% rate with no points uh, or I got, you know, five and a quarter, but I had to pay a bunch of points. Just in general, like what's, what have you guys been seeing in rates and kind of what are the guidelines in terms of like loan to values, FICOs, all that type of stuff that you've been seeing to, to get those rates, just a general ballpark. I know I came in out left field. I literally just got that question this morning. So I was like, you know what? Josh is coming on in about five minutes. I'm gonna I'm gonna start with that because that's what we we're getting a lot of. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna answer that question head on, but I want to answer maybe a previous question. I want to go just a little bit deeper, and I think the question that we should start with is what are interest rates set from? What 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 makes interest rates go up? What makes interest rates go down? Because Joe, I believe there's a lot of confusion around that. So uh, this has been a very interesting week. You know, earlier this week, we got the, the CPI print that was higher than expected. And we saw instantly, I mean, I'm talking within 15 minutes, we saw interest rates go up a quarter of a percent. That's a massive move for a market as big as a, a mortgage market. And really, it was the whole um, U.S. Treasury market, too. The yields just 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 spiked. And so, so the question is, that's, this is just such a great um, recent example. Inflation is the enemy of bonds. So I want to try to explain it like this. We got high inflation number that came out this week and instantly rates went up. What's the correlation? Why is that? So think of it not as a borrower, someone borrowing mortgage money. But think of yourself as a lender. Let's say you've got some money parked on the sidelines and, and, and you're more interested in a fixed rate of return than you are putting your money in the stock market or cryptocurrencies or something else that might have more volatility. You just want a consistent rate of return on your money. So you say, okay, Josh, I'll, I'll lend you $100,000 uh, or Joe, I'll lend you $100,000 so you can go buy your home, Joe. And I'm going to charge you, I'm going to charge you 6% for that, for that money. And it's a fixed rate over 30 years. And you say, okay, that's a, that's an okay deal. I'll take that deal today. And then I see that inflation is at 8.6%. And I go, wait a minute. The definition of inflation is 
the value of the dollar or the purchasing power of the dollar is eroding. It's going down. So if inflation is running at 8.6%, that means next year, I'm going to be able to buy 8.6% less in goods and services. But I just lent money to Joe for 30 years at 6%. Well, I'm actually losing money as, as a lender in that situation. Joe's giving me 6%. I'm losing 8.6% to the erosion of the value of the dollar. That means I'm actually losing 2.6% on my loan to Joe. So what do I say? I need more interest, Joe. I have to have more interest. Now, I've already, I've already fixed that contract with Joe. I already agreed to lend him the rate at 6%. But am I going to give Joe or Jim or John or, or, or Jeanette another $100,000 loan at 6%? Heck no. I want a higher rate of interest. And, when, when, and keep in mind that these are 30-year loans or 15-year loans. These are long-duration loans. So I'm going to factor, and there's actuarials and, and calculations, but I'm going to factor in inflation's probably not going to run at 8.6% forever. Eventually, it's going to come down, and I'm going to make some sort of return on my, my loan. But if I start to feel as, a, as an, a lender that inflation might stay elevated for longer than I had previously thought, I got to ask for 6.5% because I may be at, we may be 8, 9% inflation. Hey, inflation's still going up. I don't know when it's going to go down. So I have to ask for more interest. And that's exactly what happened in the bond market um, and has kind of consistently been happening this year. You know, there was a lot of talk about peak inflation. That means that inflation is going to peak and it's starting to come down. And people thought that was going to happen. Well, first it was transitory, right? It was, it was, <laughs> this isn't real inflation, folks. It's transitory inflation. Right. <laughs> uh, and then, it became, well, that's, that's weird because inflation keeps going up. And now people are asking the question, you know, how long are, is inflation going to go up? So to answer your question, we've seen since the start of the year, essentially mortgage uh, rates, 30-year fixed mortgage rates go up from about 3% to, we're north of 6% right now. If you look at the Fannie Mae average, which is the average mortgage across the country. We're, I, we're at 6.26%. The last number I saw, those are updated weekly. Um, and 75% of those loans, Joe, have points attached to them. Um, in fact, if you go to the number one largest lender in the country, uh, their website, you can click on their rates and today they're showing a 6.5% rate with two points, two points. So the, the rates have moved a lot higher. We're starting to see more, um, more points. Um, and we can get into that a little bit more, but let me pause for a minute and see what questions you have. Yeah, no, and the points too, by the way, like if you're saying what are points, basically one point is 1% of the overall loan. So like if it's Thank a $400,000 loan, one point cost you as the borrower $4,000. Um, if you guys have questions on that, we can get deeper into that too. But we also, I just put out an article actually that Josh helped me write about points. And so we'll be posting that up in the group probably in about a week or two. It's already live. If you guys want to go to the blog, it's there, but I'll be putting that in the group soon. Maybe even put it in the comments. Um, that actually might be part of the whole course we need to um, down the road. Uh, we'll see. But we potentially, if we have some time today, maybe we'll talk about like buying, you know, more into points, but also using it with the seller concession. So that way you can actually not have to pay for it out of pocket, all that type of stuff. Um, but just to summarize too, one of the things that Josh hit on that's really important to understand about the whole pricing of, of how loans are priced, essentially. Um, to sum that up, like basically as an investor, what you're always looking at in terms of risk, there, there's three primary things that you're looking at. First of all, you start off with the treasury and because that's the risk-free asset. So if the treasury in, in, uh, return is 3.5%, as an investor, you got to get more than 3.5% because if it was lower than that, you can just invest in the risk-free rate. Why take risk? And then on top of that, to what Josh was hitting on is the in expected inflation you have to add that increase of that. And then the third thing is risk. And so when it comes to real estate, when you're saying, what should be my, my interest rate, you got to look at like, let's just say the 10-year treasury is kind of like a benchmark. 
expected inflation. And then that's the risk part is where your ratios come in. So like your loan to value, your debt to income and your FICO score. And so like, if those are all really good, then it's just going to be the treasury and the inflation expectation. But those are bad, then there's going to be even more of a premium on top of what you're paying. And so, you know, down the road, when we talk about investing and all that type of stuff, that's always remember that, that that's how we price and judge risk and get compensated for risk as investors. OK, um, glad you did, you know, went into that because that actually goes into the next question I, I was going to get into, because this is what we're seeing. Right. Like you said, rates are six point two, five percent, six and a half percent, all this type of stuff. So now the question that we're getting and this reminds me so much of 2005 and 2006, 2007 is, well, can I use adjustable rate mortgages? All right. And we've seen as a percentage of overall loans. Uh, going into, I think, June, adjustable rate mortgages made up like 3% of the industry, of, of all mortgages. That is now up to 10%. So it's starting to climb. Now, to give you guys some reference, yep. in the whole recession in 2007, they made up 35% of all the loans. So we're not, not quite there on that yet. But I'm starting to feel that question more and more. Should I use an adjustable rate mortgage? So I'll hand it off to Josh because oftentimes, you know, I, I've said there's a difference. Right. You guys got to understand them, first of all, but there's also a difference between buying a home that's going to be your home for 30 years, investment property. Yes. What's your purpose of the loan that you're using it for? And so, Josh, I'll let you, you know, dive into adjustable rate mortgages. What are you seeing there when it's good, when it's bad? Because I know you just mentioned me the other day. You just use one to buy a house. Like, why you buy it? About five questions packed in there. So go ahead and, and take it away. I'll dive in, Joe. Uh, you're spot on the the when when fixed rates go up the alternative or what starts to look a little bit more attractive is looking at those adjustable rates now there is a major difference between the guidelines or the construct of today's adjustable rate mortgages and the adjustable rate mortgages in the lead up to the great recession yeah. when when those vehicles were created they were truly toxic and what I mean by that is the under the underlying qualification for those loans was you either had to fog a mirror or be able to spell your name, but you didn't have to do both. So first of all, they'd put anybody in there, regardless of their ability to actually repay, regardless of their the fact that they had a down payment or if that down payment was borrowed on a credit card, like it didn't matter. So so there was first of all the underlying underwriting criteria was faulty. So you had a you had a foundation that had cracks in it and leaks in it. But then on top of that, the building that they built on that foundation was not a good building. Um, it was not engineered for earthquakes. So let me tell you a few of the factors. They would have a, a loan that was had a fixed interest rate for maybe three months, six months or one year, meaning that that rate was going to adjust in the very near future not giving because over the long term joe like over seven or ten years most of us will think back and go what was my income 10 years ago there's a lot less you know at 33 i made a lot less money than i did at 43 that that's true for most people so if you have a 10-year fixed or a seven-year fixed even if that rate adjusts up at the end of the seven or ten years your income has gone up enough that in terms of the, the debt to income ratio, your income relative to your payment, you, you probably actually are better off at the end of that seven or 10 years, even if it adjusts up. But if it adjusts up in three months or six months or a year, then you have less time for wages to increase so that you can, you can handle that, that increase in payment. The other thing was, Joe, that a lot of those adjustable rate mortgages at the time had prepayment penalties. So you do a loan that had a fixed interest rate for six months, but it had a two-year prepayment penalty. So if rates went up and you went crud, I can't make that payment. You'd have to pay uh, sometimes two, three, four, five percent of your loan amount. Imagine having a five hundred thousand dollar loan. You're trying to refinance it. It's a twenty-five thousand dollar penalty. Plus, you have to pay your new closing cost, Joe. Right? So that's another two percent. Now you're talking about 35 grand to get out of your loan or you know if you want to sell your home. So so that you know we're just layering risk, right? We're layering risk on top of each other. And then to make it even worse, Joe, the prevailing 
uh, in vogue loan of the day back in 2000 to 2000, I'll say like six is kind of when this house of cards came down, was the negative amortizing loan. So I could have a teaser start payment rate based on one or 2% interest only. So I took out a $500,000 loan. I'm paying a uh, hundred, um, let's see, uh, 5%, a uh, 2%, that's $20,000 in interest. That means I'm only, you know, I've got a very, very small payment, but let's say that the actual rate, what's called the fully indexed rate was at, um, sorry, that would have been 10, 5,000, 2%. That would be, you'd be paying 10,000. Um, but let's say that the actual effective interest rate was 5% or 6%. So you're, acute, you're, you're, you're accruing $60,000 in interest if it was a 6% loan, but you're only paying based on 2%. You're only paying 10,000. So the 20,000 delta between the teaser rate or start rate and the fully amortizing rate is, is actually that $20,000 is actually adding on to your loan amount. Now put these whole this whole thing together. I couldn't really qualify and I really didn't have a down payment and my credit score wasn't that good. Uh, I have a loan that is fixed for three months or six months and is going to adjust upwards. I'm paying less than the amount of interest that is actually accruing on my loan. So every single month, my balance is going up. Oh, and if I want to get out, I have to pay a three, four, five percent prepayment penalty. I mean, goodness gracious! Like, could we have put any more tinder on the fire? Yeah, it was it's brutal. It was, it was brutal. It was. That's why I say, like, it, it was really like whoever constructed those factors and put them together was evil. I don't know how else to describe that, but it that's an evil construct to roll out to people and sell as a safe vehicle. But if I compare that today, Joe, because I'm going to get to the answer to your question, I'm sorry for rambling. The the If I compare that today, today's arms, by and large, let's say 97%, there's going to be a few small banks that do something funky, but by and large, they're fixed for five, seven, or 10 years giving the consumer enough time to increase their income in most instances. And there's no prepayment penalties. There's no negative amortization. And at the end of that five, seven, or 10 years, Joe, they can only go up 1% per year or 1% every six months. So there's a limit. And in that five, seven, or 10-year period, Joe, if, if, if I ever decide wait, I thought I only wanted this debt on my home for five or seven years because we were going to move. But now we've decided we're going to be, oh, we had another kid. I'm going to be here financed to a fixed rate. So if we go into a recession, which I think we're going to get to, and if interest rates go down, I just move from my arm to another arm, or I just move from my arm to another fixed, and I don't have those huge prepayment penalties. So I think arms get lumped into the toxic trash that was that, that created was the precursor of the Great Recession. And that's not the arms that you're seeing go from three to 10% today. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, people always ask me, because I, I, I don't like when people like, you know, they bring up adjustable rate mortgages or adjustable rate student loans or adjustable rate anything. And, you know, you're on Facebook and the immediate comments are, don't ever use it. And it's like, well, no, like there, there's always a purpose for it. That's and right. so like one of the articles I just put out, it's like, well, what are one of those purposes? It's like, well, if you don't plan on being in your house for 10 years and you say, hey, look, in the next 10 years, I'm going to be moving. Why not? Do a 10-1? Do, do you have to even do a 10-1 that's interest only? And then, you know, potentially like it starts saving for a down payment for the next house. Um, you know, personally, because people always ask me, what's, what's the one major downside, in my opinion, on adjustable rate mortgages? Um, I'm a planner and I like hedging my own risk. And so it's like, okay, well, after that adjustment period ends, I can't predict what the interest rate is. And if something happens in my life that doesn't pan out correctly or the economy tanks or something right when I am hitting that period or something happens, I, I, I'm like, oh shit. So personally, oftentimes I use like a 30 year IO. Um, for those of you that don't know what that is, it's basically a, a 30 year loan where the rate's fixed for 30 years, but it's interest only for the first 10. And then it turns into a 20 year PI after that. 
that has a little bit higher rate than your traditional 5171 or 101, but it also allows me to, to plan better. So those are the different types of things you can do. But in either one of those, like if you said, hey, I'm going to, you know, this is my primary house. I want to have it paid off by the time I'm, you know, 30 years from now. It's like, okay, do you want to use an adjustable? Because, you know, Josh's point, I've seen a lot of people get into a lot of problems um, when that monthly payment increases randomly. Now, what I don't like, and I put this in one of the articles, is when you have these horrible blogs out there that have like a big, big following and they're less like, oh, um, you know, don't ever, you know, an arm. I, I literally got this from Investopedia, by the way, Josh. Their, their writer that they hired to do their SEO stuff for them, it's not really a, a finance person. Right. Their main thing in there is that when it goes adjustable, the monthly payment always increases. And it's like, no, that's not true because it, it's tied to an interest rate. So your monthly payment can actually drop. That's right. Like, uh, that's why it's like, if you guys, my, my big thing on adjustable rate mortgage, flat out, number one, you got to understand them. If you don't understand them correctly, <laughs> don't use them. But if you understand them, you can take advantage of them. And, and I brought up, for example, like you mentioned the other day that you you used one in your situation. Um, you know, let everybody know, like, hey, like, yeah. this is why I used it in this specific situation. So they can understand, okay, when would I use this? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I know I learned so much more from people telling stories. It gives me context. So yeah. I, I think that's a really good segue. So uh, I built a home uh, a couple of years ago, built right through the Great Recession. I thank the Lord above that I got my costs fixed before, you know, the lumber and concrete and everything went crazy with COVID. Um, did I say I built before the recession? I meant I built right before, before COVID. COVID. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so, and, and when I, when that home was done being built, it, it converted and I could convert it to a fixed or an arm. And the difference between the fixed rate and the arm at the, at the time was a half a percent. So I could do, at the time, I could do a 30-year fixed at three and a half, or I could do a 10-1 10, 10 arm, a 10-1 meaning fixed for 10 years, and then it adjusts 1% per year after, 10, after the 10 years. So in the 11th year, it, can go up, it could go up 1%, and then it can adjust once per year, and then it has a caps. It couldn't go up more than 5%. So at least, even if it, in a worst case scenario, I have 10 years at 3%, year 11's at four, year at 12's at, at five, and so on and so forth till it got to eight. But, but here's what people need to realize. By the time I get to year 10, I expect two things to have happened. Number one, I expect that the half a percent in interest that I saved over that 10 years, I will not spend. That's not how I live my lifestyle. I'm not gonna go say, cool, I saved half a percent on my mortgage. Now I can go buy a Porsche. Like I just don't live that way. So that extra half a percent that I'm saving for the next 10 years is going into some sort of investment vehicle that will then be compounding. And I believe I can compound at seven to 10% over the next 10 years with my various investments. So that's, that's one thing. That's like a safety net to offset the extra risk of an adjustable rate mortgage. The other factor is I figure over the next 10 years, I'm going to continue to grow my businesses and I'm going to be making more money in my businesses. So even if the rate goes up, I, I will have more income coming into my account every month. So the percentage of money that goes to the mortgage, even if the mortgage payment goes up as a percentage basis, it's going to be lower because I believe my income will be higher. Now that's not foolproof. There could be a recession. Something could go wrong. But, but I believe that, that odds are in my favor that that is true. And then lastly, I'm, I, I, I only think I'm going to need this house. And this might be the most important factor, actually, Joe. My kids are 12 and 10. So in 10 years, this is actually a year ago, so nine years, they're going to be 19 and 21. Well, on their 18th birthday, I plan on kicking them out of the house, you know, like <laughs> I go to college. <laughs> I love you all. We're going to come visit you, but you got to go, go, go get the world. And so I, I look at this house and I say in nine years, I don't, I don't need this house anymore. My wife and I are going to downsize. We're probably going to move close to wherever the kids go to college. So that's another reason why an arm made sense for us. And last but not least, I believe that we are going to have one, if not two, relatively strong economic recessions. 
And I'm a student of history and I know what happens in recessions. Interest, when, rates. <laughs> interest rates go through the floor. So, so my guess is that in the next couple of years, I probably refinance to a five one arm because I'm closer to my kids being gone or maybe I do a seven and I'll take my interest rate down. So when, when I, when I, so to your point, Joe, if you have a plan and you know, worst case scenario, like, you know, it's like you take a piece of paper, you draw it down, you go cons, pros. Okay. What if everything goes wrong? Can the pros make up for the possible risk that I'm taking on? Yes, it can. Great. Then that, then I should do an arm. If you don't understand it that much, or you're just, you know, can't sleep at night, then just stick to a 30 year fixed. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So that's, and here's some, I did some quick math while you were you're talking, because there's one other factor too, that again, if this is a principal and interest loan, let's just say you start off at a $300,000 mortgage by year 10, it might only be like 200 grand. You nailed it. Right. So the actual interest that you're paying, even if it goes from 3% to 8%, you were paying on 300 grand, like $9,000 in interest. And even if it goes up to 8%, you might be paying like 16 grand a year in interest. So it's like $500 a month extra in interest that you're paying. But to your point, your income should also be higher. But also that half a percent difference that you save in the short run every month. And if you do that for 10 years, that's 15 grand just based off of that, that you can either invest, like you said, or use that to pay down the principal even further. Yeah. So it's like that's 15 grand over 10 years. If you had simply just doubled that, that's 30 grand. So if you really wanted to, you got a, a, a sum of money sitting there to say, hey, you know, my, my payment went up $500, worst case scenario. I, I can just keep paying that down. And so that's one of the times when we, and I, we used to do this a lot with student loans. Like if somebody was using adjustable rate mortgage, like if you're planning off, for example, paying off your debt very quickly. Well, by the time, you know, you, you get to that adjustable rate, the balance on the loan might be so low that the interest doesn't even really matter anymore because most of your payments is principal. So there's, there's different factors in there. Or like I just went through this with my dad, um, you know, on one of his properties, he has like nine years remaining left on his principal and interest loan. And I'm like, dad, why don't you just go into a 10-1? He's like, well, it's adjustable. I'm like, just keep making the same payment. You're paying off the loan in nine years. Who cares? He's like, oh, I didn't even think about that. Right. So yeah. that's, again, where you can get creative. The whole piece on that, that I wanted to emphasize with Josh, and you hit this at the very end of that, you got to have a plan if you're going to use them at the end of the day, you got to understand it. You got to have a plan if you can use it. So yeah. uh, just, I hope that helps you because I know a lot of people were asking that. Go ahead. Just one more thing, you know, because we're, 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 we're right on the cusp of something that I believe is foundational for financial success. And I, I would just want to hit this real quick. In my mind, People have, um, it, by and large, have a tremendous amount of focus, fear, whatever you want to call it, around owing any money. And I think that's the wrong place to put our energy. What, what, what I believe creates wealth is creating an a, um, income structure for your family where you have more money coming in in than going out and you take that delta and you invest it. So for example, you know, what, what, what will help people. So if, for example, if, if doing a fixed rate mortgage versus an adjustable rate mortgage or an interest only mortgage versus an amortizing mortgage, if that difference enables you as a family to invest, you win. You're better off to spread out, spread out those debts over longer periods of time and take the extra money and, and, and use it to invest and then let compound interest do its magic on the last time it, it doubles in your life cycle, that, that is more important than spending the next decade getting debt free. We have to start investing early. We have to let compound interest work its magic because Joe, I believe I, I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of at a crossroads with this whole inflation thing. And I, where I'm leaning is I believe we're going to have bouts of inflation and deflation and inflation and deflation. But long term, with all of the money printing that's gone on and all the money in circulation, I'm not super bullish in how solid the dollar is um, in terms of like overall inflation and its purchasing power. So what that means is in 30 years when I retire, 
I probably need more money put aside to support my retirement because if inflation has eroded a lot of that purchasing power, I need to start my investing earlier versus later. Did that make sense? I, I may have gone. No, it, it 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 does. Actually, I'll be filming a podcast later on today talking about you know the the whole debt situation. There, there's so much debt out there right now in terms of like the United States and stuff that they actually have to devalue debt. And the way you do that is you inflate assets. So yep. you have to nail the head. Now, like a lot of our, our viewers, you guys have heard me say this multiple times, just to sum up basically, you know, what we've been saying, manage your risk and your return will be there. I, I say that constantly. And so what a lot of people will automatically do is say, when it comes to buying a home, a fixed rate is less risk. That's what I'm managing. Adjustable rates are risky. And so if you don't understand the adjustable rates, don't have a plan with them, you're right. Then go into the fixed rate. But with the adjustable rates, there's risk. But how do you limit that risk? Understanding is first, having a plan is second, and then saying, what am I doing with this? Going back to Josh's point at the very beginning, when we were talking about the 08, you know, 07 housing crisis, people went into these without a plan, without an understanding. Yes. They didn't know how to take advantage of it. So to your point, you're taking that money and investing it. They were not doing that. Right. They were going into these mortgages because that's what they could afford. And so if you don't have a plan, you don't understand them, and you're doing it simply because you want to buy a house, and that's the monthly payment you can afford is because of that interest rate and that adjustable rate mortgage, and that's why you want to do it, oh, you're going to be in for a rude surprise, okay? And like I always say, I just be blunt about it. If that's you, you can't afford a house. Don't yeah. do it, <laughs> right? That's, yeah. that's the best advice I can give you. Um, other questions I got just from a high level, um, what markets, these kind of blend together, what markets are you seeing that are kind of staying strong, being weak? Where do you see some buying opportunities? Cause I know I just put out there, I think like two days ago, the West coast is getting hit pretty hard in terms of, of year over year, uh, contracts and all that type of stuff. You know, where are you seeing just in general, like what, where's is, Where's relatively strong? Where's weak? Where have you been seeing no declines, big declines? Just in general, where uh, where are you seeing just different areas of the map right now? Yeah, I'm gonna bring up um, I'm gonna bring up the the best tool that I know for this, and the reason I love this tool, Joe, is because it it updates every week. And you, as you know, a lot of these real estate reports come out. You know, like we're, we're, we just got the core logic report for July. Well, that's great, but I really didn't know what's happening in September. Um, so the best tool that I have found for accuracy, consistency, and in real time, I'm going to share my screen, is the Redfin slash news data center. You could just Google it, right? Redfin news data center. Now, Redfin is a real estate company they but but what i like them what that they do is they have incredible analytics and tools and and they have a, a team of economists and, and 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 financial folks behind the scenes that aggregate all of this lifetime information from all their real estate offices across the country and all the what's called the the, the nmls the uh, mls the the multiple listing service that that shows all the homes listed across the country so it's it's live time so so we can, in this tool, Joe, I can go all over. I can go all Redfin metros. And let's just look at, um, let's look at one. Let's look at inventory. So if we go with uh, month supply, okay? This is, a, this is a good way to see how much supply of real estate is out there across the country. And, and just I'll clarify for everybody who's watching this on video, um, you'll see that the blue line uh, is the 2000 is 2019 data. The red line is the 2020 data. So we'd start over. We'd start over here in the beginning of 2020. As we go across to the right over here, we end up at the end of the year in 2020. Um, the orange line is 2021. And the black line is 2022. So if we look at inventory right now, nationally, Joe, you have inventory that is 10.8 weeks supply. So we're less than three months inventory in the, in the entire United States. And that's a little bit more 
than we had here in 2020. And it's a little bit more in 2021, but not a lot. I mean, we had two months inventory right here at this time of the year in 2021. This was the hottest real estate market in the entire country. Um, we had not, let's see, uh, let's call it 10, 9.7 weeks inventory in 2020. And, and now we're at 10.8 weeks inventory. So we've got a little bit more inventory, but now let's answer your question. We can go to these, we can go to a Metro or we can go to a County. So let's say we wanted to go to, uh, Los Angeles, right. Or, or, or San Diego. Let's see what's going on in San Diego. Um, you can just type in whatever County and then you can see relative to the rest of the country, what's going on with inventory. So this is kind of interesting, Joe. I've seen this trend. This is 2020, the black line, 2022, excuse me, the black line. We started in January, the lowest inventory ever in the country um, since these, you know, going back to the 60s, the, since this data has been aggregated. And we saw this kind of peak. And I'm seeing this in a lot of markets. Inventory is actually going down. And a lot of the reasons for that right now is sellers are saying, hey, we're cool. We're just going to wait. What, you know, I've got a 2.75% mortgage. I'm not in any hurry. I'm just going to, you know, wait a little bit until, until rates go down and the buyers come back. So, so I'm seeing more inventory than the last two years to answer your question, but it's not like massive. Oh my gosh, we've got 4,000, um, 4,000 homes for sale. Um, yeah, same kind of thing with LA. See what's happened in LA peaked and it's headed down just just a little bit. Let me show you one other thing real quick, Joe, to answer your question. Um, is this the right? Yeah. This is national housing inventory right now. Can you see the screen that says near record low inventory? Yep. So in 2007, the end of 2007, right before 2008, national housing inventory hit just over 4 million. That's 4,000,000 is that number right there. And if you look at the inventory of homes for sale today, we're at 1.3 million. So there's 3.7 million less homes for sale today than there was in 2007. And I've shown you this slide before, Joe. Um, in, in 2007, we had 116 million households in the United States. In 2021, uh, with the it's year end 21 is the last time this data is available. We've got essentially 129.9, let's just call it 130 million. So today we have 14 million more households. Those are our potential buyers for real estate. And we have 2.7 million fewer homes for sale. So we're starting to see inventory go up. Interest rates and price increases are definitely making housing less affordable. That is slowing down the amount of demand. But what we're seeing is sellers not rush to sell. We're actually seeing less listings hitting the market. And I can show you those analytics if you want to know more about that. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that it, it's massive. And I mean, I've started to see some, some declines and people have asked me, you know, what I think is going to happen in terms of prices. And I think that we're going to see, you know, more price decreases coming up soon. And it doesn't like the, the numbers that you have shown, like it supports actually value staying around the same. But I'm saying that because of outside factors outside the real estate market. Um, oh, yeah, that's a very good point. Like that, that's why I think. But because of the numbers that you've shown and because of the having to do value debt by increasing the value of assets, because I think a recession is going to come, because I think the Fed Reserve, when that recession hits, is going to slice rates again. When they start dropping, I think it's going to be a massive buying opportunity to talk about investments. It's like, you know, if you, you can find a way to, to buy investment properties and all that type of stuff around that time period, it's going to be, in my opinion, a massive opportunity, the same way it was in 2008. Um, you know, if you had cash and you could put together, even if you didn't have cash, but you could put together a group of people, like three or four people that you know to buy places, like, you know, I... I I have already started doing that. I have already started reaching out to a handful of people that I know being like, Hey guys, this is the areas that we're looking at. We're thinking about doing this, this, and this with like an Airbnb, but we can use it with our own families and rent it and blah, 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 blah. And I've already started putting fills out there. 
just so that way it's like, hey, like, because if the economy crashes, regardless of numbers, all the values across the stocks, bonds, everything, it's going to be. And it's like, to Josh's point, showing those numbers are, are fantastic because it's like, yeah, like it's going to be an awesome opportunity because I think with all those other factors that it's going to do this and then it's whoop, right back up. Um, and just to give you guys an example of all this, back in 08, we put about $600 billion into the economy with the bailouts and all that stuff. And 10 years to now, you saw everything just kind of do this. We just explicitly put in like $6 trillion, 10 times that amount. And that's not even indirect payments, but like student loan forgiveness and all this other stuff. So you add all that crap up. Oh boy, we're, we're in for it. So it's going to be interesting. Um, that's anything that's, that's why, Joe, I think people need more money in their retirement accounts than they think they do. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, look, think of it like a pie. If we look at the total productivity of the United States, of all the workers selling goods and services, and you think of it as a pie, that's referred to as GDP. And what we did was we have dollars in circulation that support that amount of pr productivity. Well, wh what Joe just explained was, we just took the number of dollars in circulation and we added $6 trillion to it. The productivity pie didn't get any bigger. It just got cut into 6 trillion more pieces. And, and what that means is the value of the dollar, the purchase, if the productivity doesn't go up as fast as the amount of dollars in circulation go up, that means your purchasing power is going down. There's no other way that that can happen. So that's why I'm so passionate around, look, if you have to make a choice of pay off debt fast or invest fast, you need to invest fast. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't also be keeping your eye. And when I say debt, I'm not talking about credit card debt at 18%. I'm talking about if I can get a student loan at 3%, if I can get a car loan at 4%, if I get a mortgage at 5%, and I can make 7, 8, 9, 10% over the long term with my investments, start investing sooner because what Joe just mentioned is going to mean that the dollars you have in retirement are going to be worth less. And we got to get, we have to use compound interest. It's the only it's the only weapon I know to combat the inflation. Maybe you know a better one, Joe. No, you gotta have assets. I mean, at the end of the day. And, and so there, there's an old saying of the, of the rich and the wealthy, okay? I shouldn't say saying, it's an investment, okay? And a lot of people can't invest this way because it's very expensive. It's owning land. Land is one of the biggest inflation hedges that wealthy people use. So with everyday people, the way you can hedge that or have, get in on that is owning property, like your primary residence or whatever it is, because the land value will go up. So that, that's going to be one of the, the last questions I wanted to touch on you with is that when you buy a house, okay, so for those of you that don't know, let's just say you buy a house for a half a million dollars. There's actually two values involved in that, okay? There's a land value. And there's an improvement value, okay? In terms of the inflation, in terms of things saying, okay, if, if we want to buy somewhere, because we get a lot of people that are like, look, I don't care where I live. Where should I be buying? What should I be looking at? If you're looking at those two metrics and you're saying, look, I think that housing is going to go down and then go up. For you personally, if you're just looking at that land versus home improvement, which markets are you going to try to go towards? Somewhere that has... Okay, this five hundred thousand dollar house and the land value is four hundred thousand, and the improvements a hundred thousand, or vice versa. The land value is a hundred grand, but the improvements are worth four hundred grand. Like you personally, being you know an investor and all that type of stuff, which which one would you be kind of leaning towards, or does it doesn't even make it doesn't even matter in your opinion? Well, I, let me let me answer that by by telling you, I just read a story around. Prince William having, you know, a, an incredible inheritance. Um, and, and if you, if you look at the assets that are being handed down to him, it's, it's billions and billions and billions of potential inheritance. And guess where that money is? Land. All of it is land. All of it. Like everything else is chump change. They own 
the seabed around, you know, like around England that they lease to people. And they have all of this land. It's a 685 year estate. And they figured out how do we make these castles? Uh, how do we monetize these castles by, you know, doing events there or letting people visit them? How do we monetize the seabed? Uh, I mean, it's just, it, it, it is just incredible. So for me, when I look at any piece of real estate, I'm I'm trying to think through two different things. Number one, will it preserve value over time? And typically, real assets like real estate are going to keep pace or outpace inflation. So it protects, even if the dollar is being eroded because the crazy politicians are printing $6 trillion, the, the value of the land is, is going to continue to go up commensurate or in some periods even faster than inflation. So that's number one. But then number two, I'm always trying to think about, all right, if I'm going to build something on that land or if I'm going to improve a property I already own, what's my return on investment? So in the last, I know we're running out of time, I'll be quick. In the last, you know, I, I went about five years where I'd say 2015 to 2020-ish, where I couldn't find anything that cash flowed. I just, it just didn't make sense to me. So to your point, Joe, I said, okay, but I already own a bunch of properties. If I can improve those properties and, and yield a higher rent because of the improvement, what's my cash on cash return? And we started doing this analysis, apartment by apartment, office building by office building. And what I figured out was I could make somewhere between a 10 and 15% cash on cash return on investment by taking 20 grand and renovating a building and then increasing the rent and I could, that would pay me 10 to 15% cash on cash investment. So that's how I look at it. I want to, I want to take my life's energy, which is the, the, the income that I earn from all my hard work. I want to put it into something that is real and tangible and is expected to increase. And then I want to think, how do I monetize and cre create a rental income stream, which could be, um, leasing the seabed floor, I guess, if you own that land. It could be letting cattle go on your land. It could be putting a farm on your land. It could be harvesting trees on your land. It could be putting an apartment building on your land. Like there's all these constructs of how to monetize it. But those are the two things that I want to think about. How do I put my money in an asset that's going to continue to keep up with inflation? And then how do I monetize that to create more cash flow? Yep. Yeah. I don't know if you saw this new company pop up. My wife's like, do you want to do that? I was like, hell no, that's too much liability. The new one that just popped up is an Airbnb, but for pools. <laughs> oh, wow. And I'm like, no shot. I am not renting out my pool. Like that is. What could go wrong? <laughs> hell, like, <laughs> uh, but that that's actually why, you know, this whole gig economy thing, by the way, is taking it off because people are like, well, I have this car. I have an asset. I can't monetize it. But now if I'm sitting down, not doing anything, I can monetize my car. Like, you know, and there's, there's actually companies that have popped up around that because they're just like, Hey, like, you know, here's, I have, like, if I buy a car, I can actually have drivers rent it from me and then take a percentage, you know, and, you know, one of the land ones you brought up and, and I had a, uh, somebody that I knew and he built his entire fortune off this, you know, this is where you can get creative with some of this stuff is he had land and he's like, I don't even really need to do that much improvements, but I can use, use it for storage. And you like lease it out to boats and RVs and, you know, all that stuff. So it's basically just paved with a fence around it. Like, and he makes a ridiculous amount of money off of them. And it's like, holy cow. So there's all those ideas at the end of the day, you have to look at the cycle and like to Josh's point, it's like, look, I, you know, for five years, he couldn't find a new property that could cash flow. I'll, I'll invest in my existing properties instead. But I guarantee you, if everything crashes over the next few months, <laughs> Josh is going to be saying, hey, I might try to acquire some new properties because I improved my cash flow on this other stuff. I can take that cash and buy new properties. So that's right. Anyways, any, anything else that you would like to share uh, before we wrap it up today? Well, I don't know if we have enough time, but maybe I could do a rapid fire, Joe, because we've alluded several times in this conversation around um, both of us, it, it appears, has a belief that we're headed towards some sort of an economic recession. Oh, yeah. um, um, do, do you think I could have just like four minutes to kind of give some backstory to that? Go for it. Okay. 
So, so I 100% believe uh, same that you do. And I'll walk you through a few slides. There's, there's probably 100 that I could show, but let me just show you the ones that are the most important. This is spike in inflation rates. And um, one of this is, you know, there's different ways that they calculate inflation. Let's go <clears throat> at a high level. Um, but both of these track in different types of inflation. The gray bars are recessions. Now, remember, a recession is just the economy contracting um, with a specific depth of contraction, a, a specific breadth of contraction, and a certain amount of time of contraction. So the economy is getting smaller, and, and that's what these gray bars represent as recessions. But here's the point. Recession, or inflation goes up, recession, back in 1960. Inflation goes up, recession. 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 You're starting to notice a pattern. And here we are over here uh, in 2022. And look, we've got inflation up here in the 8% range. History tells us there's going to be a gray bar that's going to come shortly thereafter. But that's not the only indicator. Let's look at the inverted yield curve. Yeah, Typically, That's the biggest one, by the way, inverted yield curve. This is a big one. Typically, if I'm in a low, if Joe, if Joe says, hey, Josh, how much will you charge me to loan you uh, to, to borrow money for two years? And I go, two years? I'll charge you, I'll charge you five percent, Joe. Okay, cool. How long would you charge me if I wanted to borrow it for 10 years? Oh, 10 years. My kids might move in 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 nine years. I might need that money. So if you want to borrow it for 10 years, Joe, how about eight percent? So typically the longer duration you borrow money, the higher rate you're you're either going to earn as the lender or be charged as the borrower. But there's this thing in, in economics called the inverted yield curve. When, when two-year loans are paying more than 10-year loans, it's a sign that there's something wrong with the economy. They call that an inverted yield curve. And just to keep it high level, when, when this in this graph, when you go red, that means it's an inverted yield curve. And the two-year treasury bill in this case, which is a type of bond, is, is paying more or yielding more than a 10-year. And that says the economy's sick and it is very reliable. So we go into the red, recession. We go into the red, recession. We go into the red, recession. We go into the... Oh, now, here was a miss. This barely, barely inverted. We, 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 uh, something happened there that got us out of a recession, but, um, here we go. 2000 recession, 2006 recession, uh, 2019 recession in 2020. And now we're deeply inverted again. So that's another, uh, recession indicator. How Dude, about just Fed pause on that one for a minute. Just so guys let you know, that's the number one thing that I look at because, and I can't remember the exact statistic on this. But I want to say it's whenever we have an inverted yield curve, there's a 95% probability of recessions coming. That's right. So when it, yeah. when it inverted earlier this year, I was like, recession. Yep. You're totally, you're, you're spot on. And, and this was kind of like a false, like this is the 5% where it wasn't accurate. But this shows you that the inversion was only a couple of, you know, just a very small inversion. This is, this is significant. This is just as big as these, you know, these inversions in, the, in these past periods. Here's, here's, here's another one. Fed rate hikes. When the federal funds, when the Fed, when the Federal Reserve increases the Fed funds rate, that causes interest rates all down the line to increase. Home equity lines in, increase, credit cards increase, payday loans increase, um, pay, uh, buy now, pay later loans increase, business loans increase, bonds that businesses borrow. It's a contraction on the economy. And they lead to recession. So, you know, you go back to 55, virtually every time you have a steep rise in the Fed funds rate, you get a recession. Now, sorry, my, my chart only goes to 2021. But if, if you see what's happening in 2022, we have a steep rise in the Fed funds rate, which is another factor for recession. And then just this last slide, and I'll, I'll turn this off. Low unemployment rates indicate higher probability for recession because you can only you can only fill employment to a certain point you can't you can't hire a hundred percent of the economy you can only you can only hire a percentage of it so you'll notice if we go back to 1950 45 
when you have this low in the cycle of unemployment, this is unemployment below 3%, and then it starts to tick up 100% of the time, not 95%. 100% of the time when unemployment bottoms and starts to move higher, bottom starts to move higher, bottoms move higher, bottoms move higher, bottoms move higher, bio, and right now this is just starting to move higher. 100% of the time when the unemployment rate starts to go higher, meaning it's bottomed and gone up, that is the precursor to recession. So those are just like a few of the indicators, but if you stack them all on top of each other, it's pretty reliable we're gonna hit a recession, which means interest rates are gonna go down, and I'm going to refinance all my properties to lower interest rates. I'm probably going to pull some money out of those properties. And I'm going to use that to do exactly what Joe just said. I'm going to go buy a bunch of new properties. Yep, exactly. Now, one big thing I I'll leave you guys with, this doesn't have to do with like real estate right now or anything, but I like to, to talk about like mindset all the time and how to think about this stuff. There, there's a word in there that Josh used. Okay. And this is how... I like cutting through the propaganda, politicians and all that type of stuff and how to think about money right, okay? If you think about it, politicians use the word when everything's going great to describe the economy, it's expanding. We're in an economic expansion, okay? But then when everything's bad, they've, they've termed this word for propaganda called a recession. That re you know, recessions are evil, recessions. But if you actually think about it, it makes no sense. It's not logical. If you have an expansion, the opposite of that is not a recession. It's a contraction. Mm -hmm. So when you start thinking about this, it, like you get this evil word recession out of your out of your brain, and you just simply think of there's expansions and there's contractions. Yes. What are we headed for right now? A contraction. And when there's a contraction, there's a massive buying opportunity. Always there's a massive buying opportunity. So I just wanted to, to leave you with that one tidbit because it's like, and I use it too. I word, use the word recession because it's so often used that I just spit it out. But it's like, I cringe when I hear that word recession. It's like, no, it's just a contraction, you guys. Like, yeah, nothing to freak out about. But again, it's a political thing that politicians use because they know when people are feeling that pinch that that's when whoever the party is in office, historically, it's easy with, if there's a recession, the other party is going to win the, the next, the next, uh, economic or election cycle so that's all you always hear is recession 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 and it's like ah, it's not and a bad you, thing necessarily guys like you can weaponize that here. word right politicians have weaponized that word to, oh, you know it's man, your fault we're in the recession joe let me let me just share one last thing because what you just said was brilliant and i want to i want to highlight it and circle it in red and turn on the you know the spotlight on what joe just said i'm going to use an analogy when i was learning to surf I could only surf right breaks. As I got better in surfing, I could surf right breaks or left breaks. It didn't matter. I could, whatever wave the ocean wants to serve up to me, I learned to surf. As an investor, we need to, to adapt. We need to grow. We need to progress to the point where we have a plan for a recession that increases our wealth. And we have a plan for a booming market. And we need to know how to play both of those trades because both of them can create wealth for you if you know what to do in those markets. Exactly. And that goes with even bigger than that from a financial plan in general. It's like, this is what you build your plan for. And these are for the current circumstances because we know what's happening today more than what we know is going to happen in 10 years. Yes. So circumstances change. And so like when we build a plan, with people, you might start off saying, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to repay my debt. Like, because it's at this percentage, let's just say it's at 6% or 7%. Some of the student loans are, you know, that high. Okay. Well, all of a sudden rates go down. I can refinance that debt into a two or 3% debt. Maybe I don't pay it off aggressively anymore. Maybe I turn around and switch my, my financial plan to investing more versus trying to pay it off. So, okay. I mean, I, because I get that question all the time, well, should I pay off my debt or not? It depends. <laughs> like everybody's different, first of all, but it just depends on where we're at in that, that economic cycle too, and what you feel comfortable with. And I give the example all the time, like, you know, I had a two point or a 1.75% interest rate on my student loans. I, I took as long as I could to pay that off. 
Right. So like I have right now, I have, I just, I took out before the raise, the increase, I took out a half a million dollar loan. That's a 30 year loan at 3.25%. I'm paying it off as low as I can. And like, you know, so it just depends on, on your circumstance, how you understand it, you know, and I'll wrap up with that again. Any, any parting words for this update, uh, Josh? Well, this was a lot of fun. First of all, I love hanging out with you. Um, I love this community. And um, I, I think next week, you know, we're going to see the Federal Reserve raise the Fed funds rate by somewhere between 75 and 100 basis points. And a lot of people think that that's going to be bad for mortgage interest rates. I, I want to come back and I want to dissect that. I actually think it's going to be good for mortgage rates. And, and the reason why is was the Fed aggressively raises the Fed funds rate, which is an overnight bank lending rate, that slows down the economy. When the economy slows down, inflation goes down. And then when inflation goes down, as a bond investor, I can, I can accept lower interest rates. So let's just kind of set the hook that yeah. we've got a major event happening next week. We're going to come back at our next, our next time together, and we'll dissect that and see how the Fed raising short-term interest rates, the Fed fund rates, actually impacted mortgage rates. Is that a, is that a fair uh, hook to set? That would be, that would be awesome. And then just to, to sum up uh, or just to reiterate, like you, uh, I mentioned earlier at the beginning, we're going to be doing these once a quarter, the live chats. <clears throat> you guys, if you guys can't make it on live, I will be posting in, you know, on podcasts. Throughout the quarter, you guys got questions, ask them, you know, you guys know how to reach us at, at Fitbucks. Um, I mentioned you guys, you know, we're thinking about doing the real estate investment course. So if you're interested in that, you know, just say that in the comments. Um, Neo Home Loans, you know, you guys asked me, I did get some questions earlier this week because some people found out as we've been posting some stuff about the partnership. Why did we partner with them specifically? One, Josh is extremely uh, intelligent when it comes to all this mortgage stuff and the real estate market and all their loan officers are that way. But they also, as you guys know, we help everybody, but we're primarily in healthcare and they have a lot of knowledge of mortgages for specific healthcare professions. So great resource for you guys, especially if you guys are going to be buying houses or investment properties coming up here, you know, in the next six to 12 months, start reaching out to them and so on and so forth. Um, and if you guys got questions, you know how to reach us. Josh, as always, it's, it's fun and I'm looking forward to the next time. Me as well. And don't feel, uh, don't hesitate to email me any questions you have on the specifics of your situation. I'm here to help. Perfect. Talk to everybody soon. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Joe. All right. We are good.